Hi, everyone. I think we can get going. So <laughs> it's like a classroom again. Uh, I'm Anne Marie Slaughter. I'm the CEO of New America. And welcome, all of you in the room and all of you online, uh, to uh, our event, Section 230 and the Public Interest, Proceed with Caution. Uh, so we are, uh, New America is delighted to host this with our partner, the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, and we uh, are really happy to have all of you here for a very important discussion. Uh, we're going to be looking at Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, known in these circles just as Section 230, uh, and, but particularly its impact on the public interest internet uh, and how potential reforms to, to Section 230 will affect the public interest internet. So the Open Technology Institute works at the intersection of technology and policy uh, to ensure that every community has equitable access to digital technology and to its benefits. Uh, so we, are, we take a multidisciplinary approach to promoting universal access to an open, secure, and interoperable internet. Uh, OTI is part of New America's new technology and democracy cluster, uh, a group of our tech programs that are together committed to both developing and governing technolo technological tools that's in ways that serve the public interest, democracy, uh, and to also to reduce inequality. And at the heart of all of that is corporate accountability. Section 230 uh, passed in 1996, uh, courtesy in part of our keynote speaker, uh, Senator Wyden, uh, was really passed as a foundational law to help the internet grow. It is a critical liability protection uh, that allows any internet service the freedom uh, to choose whether and how to deal with user-generated content, all that content that many of us uh, put on the internet. So that allows sites, big, big and small, uh, to moderate content, to, to develop uh, ways of moderating content without fear of litigation. There's a heated debate, as all of you know, about uh, Section 230. Uh, on many insist that big tech companies use Section 230 to shield themselves from liability for lots and lots of harmful content. Uh, as we, as you might guess from Proceed with Caution, uh, both uh, OTI and New America and the Wikimedia Foundation actually counsel caution uh, in experimenting with Section 230 uh, and thinking through all the unintended consequences uh, and, and potential downsides that may be less evident. So in particular today, we're going to be looking at the impact of Section 230 on the public interest internet, on the ways in which everything from Wikipedia, which I still probably check many times a week without question, uh, but also local libraries uh, and small public interest organizations, uh, the ways in which all of us uh, benefit uh, from Section 230 uh, or are impacted by Section 230. So it gives me great pleasure with that introduction uh, to introduce uh, Senator Ron Wyden uh, as our keynote speaker, one of the authors uh, of Section 230, along with former Representative Chris Cox of Connecticut, uh, Senator Wyden of Oregon, I should have, should have mentioned. Uh, Senator Wyden is, is a senior member of the Senate Select Committee uh, on Intelligence and the top de Democrat uh, on the Senate Finance Committee, which are two very important areas of the, of the Senate. Uh, and he's very well known for his work in advocating a free and open internet uh, and as well, uh, in addition to advocating for uh, d user data and privacy protections. Uh, also joining us today is Ashley Gold, who is going to moderate the Q&A uh, part of the conversation. Uh, Ashley Gold is the technology policy reporter with Axios, uh, and sh but she's had experience reporting for the information, Politico Pro, and BBC's Washington Bureau. So thanks to all of you for coming, and please join me in welcoming Senator Wyden. Thank you.
thanks very much, and uh, it's great to be with all of you, and uh, I'm going to make this a filibuster-free zone, okay? <laughs> and we're going to talk a bit about 2.30, obviously, and let me start it um, this way. More than a quarter century of empowering Americans to make their own choices online and take responsibility for those choices is what Section 230 is about in a sentence. And over the years, uh, there have been opinion articles written uh, that have said that our law, for example, created a trillion dollars worth of wealth in the private economy. I'll let people debate that, but what I'll tell you is I'm most proud most proud is what Wikimedia has done with Section 230. That's what I cite when people want to know what 230 is all about. So, first of all, what 230 is, and a lot of people I think sometimes think it's some kind of uh, fuel substitute or something like that. They're going to order some 230. It's a law that Chris Cox and I wrote in 1996. And one core part of the law, the so-called 26 words that created the internet, that really stands for one simple proposition. And that is the individual who created a piece of content online is the person responsible for it. And back then, when we were having a big debate about the future of the internet, I said, let's get down to this personal responsibility concept. And that's what it's about. Another part of the law broadens the First Amendment's protections and allows websites to take down posts that they don't want. Here, we're talking about stuff like hate speech, violent content, that kind of thing. And you can take it down and elevate other posts. Together, these provisions allow for online services to hosts and moderate content without fear of being under lawsuit deluge. Unfortunately, a lot of the debate is basically on whether this is just a big windfall for big social media companies. I want to emphasize that our goal was not about anything like big guy protection. It was about emphasizing users. We wanted to make sure that they could speak online and access interesting content. And second, that startups and small sites that want to compete with the incumbents, whether that's going up against big cable or big tech, Everybody from Wikipedia to public library services and knitting message boards, we wanted them to be in a position to be competitive. So for all of us users, Section 230 is what allows sites to host controversial speech. That is the speech that we really care about, the speech that propels progress, supports democracy. Platforms could make a lot of money posting inoffensive clickbait that lines their pockets with revenue while forgetting about that kind of speech that challenges power and uncovers the truth. The controversial speech is essential. We know all too well that individuals and corporations with power are happy to use legal structures and legal systems to silence whistleblowers or dissenters and activists. Without 230, Platforms would be happy to get rid of important speech. It's just not that important to their bottom line. For example, look at how Republican politicians in states across the country are trying to shut down online conversations about abortion and reproductive health. Section 230 is the first line of defense against those repressive laws. Or how they're trying to shut down access to gender affirming care and access to information about gender identity, including by banning books and teaching on the subject. Section 230 helps ensure that critical information gets online and accessible for those who need it most. And look at the Me Too movement or police accountability movements in 2020. 
I don't think any Me Too post accusing powerful people of wrongdoing would even be allowed on a moderated platform without Section 230. Nor would black journalists have been able to use Twitter to call out their own management on coverage of police violence. It's been clear that for several years, MAGA Republicans and their Supreme Court justices, <clears throat> Alito and Thomas, want to take a sledgehammer to 230. And it's not to help consumers or create a healthier online environment. They just want to get rid of 230 to force companies to carry harmful content because that promotes their political agenda. And to obscure their motivations, they falsely claim that getting rid of 230 would solve everything from the opioid epidemic to sex trafficking to bias against conservatives online. My comment, they ought to be careful what they wish for. When Congress passed sesta Foster over my objection, we all said that this was a horrible scourge. I don't take a backseat to anybody in talking about how evil these people are. They came out with this laudable goal of stopping sex trafficking online. And I went to the floor of the Senate and I said, it's not going to work. And it's going to cause a lot of collateral damage. Five years later, that misguided law has ended up doing nothing, nothing to protect victims or bring sex traffickers to justice. When was the last time you saw a politician hold a news conference to talk about sesta Fosta? I can't find any of them. Instead, what sesta Fosta did is drive sex work to the dark web and dark alleys, and by all accounts, violence against those individuals. Meanwhile, the threat of lawsuits has led sites to take down content that has nothing to do with sex trafficking. So I would just tell you, if you want a preview of a world without 230, it is sesta Fosta. Stopping online conversations won't solve the problems politicians claim they will. But without 230 in the First Amendment, it will be harder for people without power, without clout, without political action committees, the marginalized voices, to call out wrongdoing by the powerful. And it'll certainly be easier for government to set the terms of public debate. That's what the MAGA Republicans want to do in, Republic, in uh, Florida and Texas, where they pass laws to force the platforms to carry content that drives out vulnerable speakers that are disproportionately the targets of the content. Mega Republicans want that kind of uh, content uh, left up, the kind of content that allows them to drive their points of view. And those laws are going to have their day in the highest court this fall. And I hope the justices see the law as plainly violating the First Amendment and being preempted by 230. So, if 230 were repealed tomorrow, there would be immense pressure on websites to quickly take down content that offends people with power and anything else outside of the comfortable and the mainstream. I don't believe Americans want that kind of world. I sincerely hope that no Democrats play into the hands of right-wing culture warriors and help them use Section 230 to force sites to give voice to hate and radicalism. Now, Section 230, as I've said, protects startups and smaller sites. If Section 230 were, were repealed tomorrow, there wouldn't be any blue skies challenging Twitter. These upstart federated services depend on 230 to protect their users who create and manage their own content moderation programs within the small communities that comprise this whole decentralized service effort. And without blue sky, where else could I mock my staff for not having invites yet. <laughs> so, Section 230, I'm one of the co-authors with Congressman Chris Cox, isn't perfect. We're always looking at a way to make the internet a better place for users. You know, my family has said, when Ron talks about the internet, all he's really going to tell us is about users, users, users. Well, I'm sorry to be repetitive, but I think that's the bedrock principle we ought to be all about. You know, a lot of people say otherwise. There are people who want to repeal Section 230 and say, it's a get out of jail free card. 
I just point everybody to the brief Chris Cox and I submitted to the Supreme Court in Gonzales. We took care to highlight a number of cases where courts decided companies were not protected by Section 230. Lemon versus Snap, where a family sued over Snapchat speed filter. The company created the filter. It's not user-generated content. It's not um, protected by 230. It also doesn't protect Amazon when it delivers defective products or websites that provide illegal uh, online home rentals. If you write an algorithm that only shows housing ads to people of a certain race, which Justice Sotomayor was uh, concerned about, the courts have correctly decided no protection, none from 230. So I'm sure the court read what Chris Cox and I wrote. I'm just absolutely convinced they read every word and were persuaded by our brief that they decided not to rewrite the statute. So I say, you're welcome. We're making light of this, of course. I know many folks there spent nights drafting briefs and we thank them. The outcome in Gonzales highlights another point. Many of the claims that commentators and my fellow legislators bring up of being blocked by 230 often wouldn't go far on their own. The court found that the claims, for example, in Gonzales couldn't give rise to liability in their own right. No 230 needed. Where courts find that 230 doesn't bar a claim, the parties often end up at the same destination. Case dismissed. Courts might say that a platform's actions were too far removed from the harm or the claims elements weren't met or dismissed for some other reason. But that only happens many months and tens of thousands of dollars later. Truly ruinous. So two final points. Anytime I get the opportunity to talk about why content moderation and 230 are important, I also want to be clear about big tech. OK? Google, Meta, Twitter, Microsoft, all of them have to do a better job of protecting users on their sites. It's a horror what's happening with Twitter now having divested so much uh, particularly from trust and safety. Second, to my mind, the first place to start holding companies accountable is to pass a strong federal privacy law. That's to attack the business model so many of the big tech companies depend on. If you take away the incentives to hoover up users' personal information, you make it much harder to target them. It'll provide protection for people if you take away the incentives to target them. And particularly, we don't want people to um, targeted with objectionable content, and we want to make sure that we're protecting kids and teens. I also support more aggressive antitrust enforcement and the open app market uh, agreement to create more competition in our markets and make it easier for more companies and new speech forums to grow. I said I'd give you two more points. That'll be it. Um, softball questions will be especially welcome. I think Leslie <laughs> is asking uh, today. So uh, thank you again to Wikimedia. You all, every single day, day in, day out, are making a big difference. Back to my favorite word for users. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Where are we? Oh, OK. Great. OK. Hi, everyone. My name is Ashley Gold. I'm a tech policy reporter with Axios. Um, I was just telling the senator backstage that the first time he and I ever had a conversation about Section 230 was in 2017. Uh, so it's been a while. This topic has been percolating, it gets a little more relevant every year. Uh, so since you mentioned the Supreme Court, let's start there. Were you at all surprised by the result in Gonzales? Was that what you were expecting to happen? Well, I have to tell you, I didn't expect the court to come out with nine nothing. Look, uh, I mentioned the fact that, you know, we filed a brief. We're not saying the court was, you know, sitting there watching it. But I'm also, while we won nine nothing, I'm not convinced we're out of, yeah. out of uh, the challenge uh, place. Um, certainly those cases, you know, the deal with, uh, you know, free speech, uh, it seems to me they're First Amendment violations, but with this court, who knows? And with the Supreme Court, I mean, Justice uh, Clarence Thomas has talked about wanting to amend Section 230. They did not do it, given the chance here. So now that it's been punted back to Congress again, 
What should Congress do, if anything, or is your ideal scenario that we keep going status quo, the law is what it is, and we just keep hoping for the best? Well, I'm always open to new ideas. I sketched out a couple of, of principles first. I wanted to make sure we protected moderation. That was key, and I wanted to make sure we protected the First Amendment. I mean, look at blue sky right now. If you really want to take on Facebook, blue sky is out there because of Section 230 and the protection for users and the uh, structure of you know, our law. Green lights, startups, and competition. You know, Leslie, I want to take just for a minute. The big guys have got enough power to take care of themselves. They can buy all the content and all the coverage that they could possibly want. My constituency has always been the users, the smart startups, the people who wouldn't have a chance to get out on this you know, internet playing field without Section 230. So I'm always open to new ideas. I gather there's going to be a hearing in the Judiciary Committee about Section 230. I hope they'll have some people who share our views. Let me be diplomatic and put it that way. <laughs> Have you seen any ideas uh, from your colleagues in Congress over the years that were good Section 230 reform ideas? Well, there's always interest in civil rights issues. I feel very strongly about protecting uh, those kinds of, of priorities. But mostly, it's about people on the right who are trying to get more far right voices out there. I hope my colleagues in the Democratic Party, who are absolutely right to be concerned about you know, hate and bullying and the like, don't put in with those far right voices because we could end up with a lot more speech in this country being silenced both on and offline when we're already seeing you know, book banning and the like. So let's talk about the topic du jour, AI. Uh, we Does have that come up these days? A little bit, a little bit. It's 230 more. It's definitely still more important. But um, so, you know, you talk about, you know, colleagues from uh, the Democratic Party uh, teaming up with colleagues on the right. We have a prime example of that with Senator Josh Hawley and Richard Blumenthal putting out a bill last week that would strip 230 protections from AI-generated works. Now, we don't even know exactly what that means or what that would look like in practice, but you know that would be pretty spooky for a company like OpenAI or Meta that are working on these generative products. I'm sure they wouldn't support a bill like that. What do you think of that effort? Well, our 230 law was about hosting. That was the core kind of principle. It was not about generating content. And so I'm already on record as saying that when you're talking about chat GPT, you know, for, for example, you know, which is being integrated into popular digital services and, uh, and the like, it shouldn't be protected by Section you know, 230. Now, the Hawley Blumenthal you know, bill, I've already said that you know, I'm not for uh, protecting generative content. I think we ought to wait a little bit and think through what the implications are before we go out writing bills. Also, I think there needs to be some effort to define generative AI. As it stands, it could be read to include search engines, which I've said before should be seen as distinct from generative AI chatbots. If you withhold Section 230 immunity, from search engines, I think that'd be a disaster for all of us who care about users and speech and the like. So I don't see a big rush to move here. The Congress already has a to-do list on the technology front that we know are real problems. And you've already heard me say, right up at the top of it, is we ought to pass a major federal privacy law. I don't know if you saw, I was able to get declassified information from the director of national intelligence with respect to all the commercially available information. Read that analysis. I'll tell you, because we've all been working in these tech precincts, that report basically outlines how the government is in a position to collect almost as much information as 
people were talking about back in the John Poindexter days of total information awareness. So I just want to say the top priority ought to be passing a federal privacy law and also um, passing my Algorithm Accountability Act because that would make automated decision systems more accountable. So you're not entirely opposed to the idea that uh, companies that have products like ChatGPT and BARD should be held responsible for the content that those generative AI products are spitting out? Yeah, I th look, the 230 bill was to protect hosting. It was not to protect a generative you know, content kinds of information. And my colleague, Chris Cox, my colleague and friend says, if you're talking about something which even in part is generating new content, no protection. Okay, very interesting. Um, so a lot of the conversation around Section 230 has revolved around children's safety online. There's this idea that Section 230 gives big tech companies an excuse to not tackle that problem of abuse on their platforms. Are having those conversations in the same vein, is that, is that the right thing to do? I mean, it, are solutions to children's safety online to be found in 230, or do you feel it should be an entirely separate conversation? Well, let's talk about, you know, kids. Um, I think, for example, the uh, Durban, you know, legislation would be a big mistake. I think kids would be less safe in that kind of situation because of the damage done to encryption. Mm -hmm. I think my colleague, Senator Markey, and his, I think it's called the COPA bill, mm -hmm. takes the right kind of approach. It doesn't devastate 230, but it protects kids. Yeah. So, you know, look, I, I have, uh, my wife and I are older parents. My wife owns the Strand Bookstore in New York City, so people always come in and blame her for stuff I'm doing. And, you know. <laughs> That's and, so cool, she's so much cooler than you. Right. I had no idea. <laughs> Amazing. So, you know, the point really is all of us, uh, we have twins that are 15, little one that's 10. We look at all this stuff and say, we got to find ways to get this kind of filth out of the sight lines of our kids, which is why the big tech companies ought to get off their tush and get serious about moderating. I mean, I don't carry any brief, folks, for big tech. My brief is for the startups and the competitors and the marginalized, you know, voices. The big tech people can take care of themselves. You look at my career in public service. I've always been on the side of the people who don't have the power and the clout, and that's still true. So you've mentioned a couple of times, you know, you're not carrying the torch for big tech, but ultimately um, it's big tech that really, really, you know, they benefit from these laws. Wikimedia and smaller startups benefit from these laws as well, but it gives people who are against 230 such an easy talking point to say, hey, this is a get out of jail free card for big tech. When you're having those sort of like honest discussions with your colleagues on the Hill and they say that, what do you say? Why well, tell them about SESTA FOSTA. The vote was 98 to two on SESTA FOSTA. And everybody said, oh, Ron, how can you do this? Your political career, you've been so valuable, um, will be over. And I said, you're going to see that this law is a mess. It's a mess. The bad guys went to the dark web. We got more violence against these vulnerable you know, people on the streets. So Leslie, the way I start the conversation is, guys, had a press conference recently on SESTA FOSTA. Anybody out there talking about how great it was? You want to see the future? Of all these kind of bills, that's what it is. So let me just finish on one point about big tech. Big tech is for 230, mostly in theory. They liked 230 basically before they were big. You know, they basically liked um, the opportunity to grow and hire engineers early on because they didn't have to hire attorneys. But now that they're big, now that they're big, they got teams of lawyers, they sit back, they relax, and mostly what they're interested in, folks, is stopping competition. Do you know what happened on SESTA FOSTA? Facebook, for example, was all interested in what we were doing. I remember when Mark Zuckerberg came to my office for the first time, told me how great it was, 
At the end, when they were getting flack on so many things, Facebook basically pulled up the moat and said, we got what we needed out of this thing. We got a chance to lead and corner the competitive market. Let's keep everybody else out. And they supported Sesta Fosta, which two people in the Senate voted against. And you know, I think I've made the point. So. <laughs> um, I have one more question for you, and then I'm going to let the audience uh, do a few questions. But there's been a lot of talk about AI lately and sort of this opportunity lawmakers have to set foundational laws for AI. And I hear a lot of lawmakers saying, let's not make the same mistake we made uh, with you know, Web 1.0 and social media by passing something like Section 230. We can't make that mistake again. What do you think when people say that? Well, I, I tell them I'm always open to new ideas, but let's not miss facts. I always tell them, for example, the New York Times uh, once printed a very large article. I went to school on a basketball scholarship. I'm 6'4", and it made the article made me out to be seven feet tall. <laughs> and it said, Ron Wyden and Chris Cox, the authors of the law that empowers hate speech. And we don't do this very often. We got in touch with them. And we said, you do know that the First Amendment makes more than 97% of the speech we're talking about acceptable in our country. Don't hear anybody talking about getting rid of the First Amendment. And the New York Times, to their great credit, printed a very long retraction saying that most of the hate, vile speech is not due to Section 230. So I realize, Leslie, your point is a very good one. It takes more time to lay out my side because we all hate this slime and bullying and just trash that's there. But do you really want to cut off the voices of Me Too and Black Lives Matter and Blue Sky? I'm open to new ideas. But I think we ought to be real careful when we're talking about making sure the voices of people who don't have power and clout, you know, get heard. And that's been my case. That's been my brief since we began and still is. Okay. Thank you very much. I've been told we're actually out of time. I'm sorry we don't have time for audience questions. But thank you so much, Senator Wyden. Be continued, everybody. Thanks for thank being you. here. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for staying and hanging in with us. That was a great discussion. My name is Lillian Corral, and I'm the head of technology and democracy programs at New America and also the senior director of the Open Technology Institute. So as Anne-Marie started to share a little bit earlier, here at OTI, we focused on what internet platforms can do to strike a balance between preserving freedom of expression online and ensuring safety including through our work on the Santa Clara principles. And whether or not platforms are run by for-profit entities like Facebook or Twitter, trust and safety is critical. Legislatively, we believe that the most productive way to think about this public debate is to zoom out from the text of the law and to focus on the broader context of online content moderation. And instead of proposing reforms to Session 230, we should be working off of widely accepted policy principles on content moderation and algorithmic accountability, um, including, as Senator Wyden alluded to, um, the, accountability, the Algorithmic Accountability Act in 2022, which uh, OTI has supported um, and the senator has so greatly championed. As he mentioned this year, the Supreme Court considered two landmark cases indirectly challenging Section 230. And it's clear that the court's rulings have sidestepped defining the scope of, the, of Section 230's reach and sending the challenge back to lawmakers where they must balance the need for greater platform accountability and freedom to publish, organize, curate, and share content online.
This next panel is going to, we're going to hear from, is a set of public interest organizations, um, and they'll discuss what's at stake for them vis-a-vis -vis Section 230 reforms and why lawmakers must safeguard our democracy and avoid any hasty or overly blunt changes to the statute. So please join me in welcoming our panelists. Um, first, our co-host and former New American, Rebecca McKinnon, the Vice President of Global Advocacy at the Wikimedia Foundation. Feel free to start coming up. <laughs> Peter Ruthier, Policy Counsel at Internet Archive. Andrew Lee, Digital Media Strategist and Author. And, ooh, and Catherine Klosdek, the from the Association of Research Libraries, the director, as Director of Information Policy and Federal Relations. And lastly, to moderate the discussion, Rebecca Kern from Politico. Thank you, Rebecca. Well, everyone was introduced, so um, I can say everyone's names again and, and quickly describe your bio. But um, at the end, we have Rebecca McKinnon, who's also the co-host today. And she's vice president of global advocacy at Wikimedia Foundation. Peter Ruth here um, is pol public um, policy Council at Internet Archive. Uh, Andrew Lee is digital, a digital media strategist, um, author, and Wikimedia at large. Um, you would need to explain this to all of us, um, your role there. And um, Catherine Klosek, Information Policy and Federal Relations Director at the Association of Research Libraries. So um, I'm, I'm a tech policy reporter at Politico and have the honor of moderating the panel and covering Section 230. Um, and watched the Supreme Court cases very closely as you guys did. Um, and I wanted to kind of get your, each of your positions on, on the law itself and, and where you see it's been beneficial in your area of work. And we can go down the line, but. Sure. Well, as Senator, first of all, thank you so much for, for to New America for, for hosting this event today. Um, at, the, at this, I think, critical year for, for the law. Um, as Senator R Wyden said, Wikipedia would not exist without Section 230, and that is absolutely true. Uh, Section 230 not only protects, and, and just to clarify, the Wikimedia Foundation, which I work for, is the technical and legal host of volunteer-run platforms. So. Wikipedia, of which Andrew is an active editor, is all the content is written and edited and uploaded by volunteers with rules that are set by volunteers and enforced by volunteers. The foundation hosts technically the, the, you know, the servers that enable Wikipedia to be accessed by people around the world. Um, and uh, we also house the, the lawyers uh, and the policy teams that, of course, deal with many government uh, requests, demands, um, deal with, with compliance um, around the world and so on. And so just to come back to our position, Section 230 then um, makes it possible for the foundation to run the servers to host Wikipedia and other volunteer-run platforms without having to intervene um, for fear that anything that people might write on a particular encyclopedia article might result in us getting sued, right? So you couldn't actually enable and empower a community to self-govern on platforms that they are building uh, and and uh, and and governing without Section 230 protections, without what technically, you know, according to legal lingo, intermediary liability protections, right? It protects us from the liability. But similarly, it also protects the moderators. So Wikipedia may be a site that anyone can edit, edit but it's not a free-for-all zone. It's it's not a state of nature. It has rules and governance around what is well-sourced content, <laughs> right? And Andrew will talk more about that. But that, but Section 230 also protects people like Andrew who actually enforce the rules. So if somebody's posting something that is against the rules for what a well-sourced 
fact is about a particular topic, he can delete the content without being afraid of being sued by whoever posted it in the first place. So it, it, it hosts both the community, it, it protects both the communities and the platform itself to enable communities to build um, an information environment that serves their needs and interests. And in this case, you know, an educational encyclopedia um, in many, many languages that, that it spans across the world. Um, and Andrew, of course, can uh, talk about more examples. He's not an employee of the foundation, but he and you know several hundred thousand other people are what make Wikipedia and the related projects what they are today. Do you want to jump in, Andrew, and share your role? Yeah, I guess it might be useful early on to tell you a little bit about what you may kind of infer after hearing more about it, but it's great to hear Senator Wyden on stage directly link 230 and the Wikimedia community and the Wikipedia, you know, which I call the revolution in my book that I wrote back in 2009. And the reason why a lot of folks may not appreciate this is that when Section 230 was um, proposed and was the law of the land, that was a really important time of development of the internet in the 1990s, right? And it was the reason why the US is still the leader in entrepreneurship when it comes to user-generated content, right? We took, look at all the major platforms online. You talk about Facebook, Twitter, and you know, Reddit and Wikipedia, you know, where they're talking at the time about the user-generated revolution, right? Web 2.0, the read-write web um, that we were in the United States a leader in. It's also what allowed Internet Archive to, to proliferate and to do the things that they do as well. Um, so something that you may not know is, as Rebecca said, there is a Wikimedia Foundation. They have a big budget that they um, manage from the donations come in, but 99% well north of 99% of all the content on Wikipedia is done by volunteers by design because you do not want a nonprofit responsible for all that content. And it's the many, many thousands of volunteers over the last 20 some years that allowed Wikipedia to become the multilingual number one reference site in the entire world. So you may not know this because you probably experienced Wikipedia in only one or two or maybe three languages. Wikipedia is available in over 200 plus languages around the world. It's the number one reference site in almost every language in the world. Curiously, not Korean, but almost every language in the world, it is the number one reference site of its kind. Uh, and that's really an amazing accomplishment that could only really happen with 230 as the climate for this. So just one last thing I'll, I'll mention, we can get into some discussion. We do have this kind of black swan kind of scenario we play in our community every few years. Because we do have to look out for this, right? Wikipedia started as a project in the United States, originally out of San Diego, California, it is now an international project. Volunteers are all over the world, but the servers are hosted in the United States. It's a US nonprofit. Those servers being in Virginia, across the water there, and in Texas and other places in the US, is really important because we have those 230 protections. So we do this black swan scenario where we say, if we had, either by choice or by necessity, if we had to move Wikipedia to some other place, where, what other places could compare to the environment that we have in the United States in terms of Section 230 protections, legal climate around public domain, copyright, anything else? And every year we do this, we cannot think of another country that has the same type of environment as the United States, not even close. 230 is so, uniquely special to Wikipedia's existence and its health and its impact that we've never found another place that is even close to this. And we've thought about places like Iceland and other uh, strange jurisdictions, we couldn't come close. And just think about, and we can get into this later, just how foundational Wikipedia is, not just for your day-to-day -day work, for students around the world, but also for training AI. It is the main corpus that all these AI systems are trained on. So. As Senator Wyden said, would you rather have inoffensive clickbait as the foundation for AI, or would you rather have the world's number one reference site uh, contributed by volunteers all around the world that is an amazing resource um, as that foundation for generative AI? And it's the reason why AI is so hot now is because we have a source like Wikipedia that is so um, well-built over 
two decades by this volunteer community with 230 as its basis. Yeah, exactly. And Peter and Catherine, you both kind of have more of the research and library backgrounds. Um, so could you kind of briefly just share how 230 is beneficial in each of your fields? Mm -hmm. you want to start, Peter? Sure. Yeah, sure. And I, I think it's, it's important to, or it's helpful to take our minds back, as Andrew was doing, to the 90s, to the earlier days of the internet. And there were a lot of interesting new ideas and new innovative ideas, one of which was Wikipedia, that Section 230 enabled. And the Internet Archive, I think, was one of those. And it was, like many of the other ones, looked like a crazy idea, right? And so one of the crazy ideas that the Internet Archive had was, let's just make a preservation copy of the web, right? This is the Wayback Machine, which is what most of you probably think about if you've heard of the Internet Archive. Let's just make a copy. And we'll just have a public record copy to preserve for the future of how the web has evolved and, and what's been put there. And you know this was considered kind of wacky at the time. And now it's like a core function of the internet. It's core internet infrastructure. And the thing, one of the key things that enabled that to happen was Section 230. When we carry out our preservation mission, our preservation function, we're not doing something that when people talk about Section 230 reform, they tend to be interested in, right? We're not doing social media. We're not doing promotion. We're not doing surveillance advertising. We're executing on a core preservation function. And we're only able to do that and focus on that because we have the protection of Section 230. Otherwise, we'd have to get involved in the sort of content moderation decisions that a number of these laws are seeking to impose on social media companies, sure, but frankly, the rest of the internet, too. And so that, that was part of the core protection that Section 230 provided that allowed the kind of innovation to flourish that led to Wikipedia, that led to the Internet Archive, and that hopefully can lead to new things in the future, too, as long as we preserve a free and open internet. And um, I'm representing the Association of Research Libraries, as was mentioned, um, ARL. So I really want to thank um, New America, OTI, and Wikimedia for inviting libraries to be part of this uh, conversation. So our association um, is a trade association uh, representing 127 uh, research libraries um, in, in the U.S. And so we, our member libraries, serve um, communities of researchers, academic communities, um, patrons of research libraries that also function as public libraries, like New York Public and Boston Public, as well as users of um, federal libraries. So you can imagine um, the breadth of online activities that our members host. And all of these are allowed and um, facilitated by Section 230. Um, just to name a few examples that you uh, might be familiar with, um, you know that libraries collect and digitize um, collections, often that are meaningful to particular communities. And a lot of times, libraries invite those communities to engage with those works, with those collections, um, through crowdsourcing programs or initiatives. So inviting third-party content because of um, uh, and user-generated content. Because of Section 230, um, you know, we don't have to be concerned about liability if a nefarious actor were to upload something, um, content that's illegal, malicious, harmful, and so on. Um, Libraries provide internet access. That's a, a basic um, and foundational example. So whether it's you know walking into a public library to access the machine or network access through um, a, an institution of higher education, that's that's another function that um, that Section 230 protects as well. Academic libraries in particular also operate um, uh, public access repositories, so repositories of digital scholarly works. So researchers, students, um, faculty can upload um, you know, journal articles, conference recaps, uh, oral histories, uh, you know, all kinds of scholarly digital works. Um, and because of Section 230, libraries don't have to use filters or um, humans to pre-screen that content or to over-remove content, um, which would interfere with the research ecosystem and, and research functionality. So um, because of all these functions that Section 230 has allowed you know, libraries to host and foster, our position has been um, we're against repeal. Um, or sunsetting Section 230, and um, we've we've cautioned um, against uh, reform, and we've really asked that you know in conversations with um, congressional staff and others, we've asked that libraries have a seat at the table in conversations about Section 230 reform, um, or more broadly, online harm. 
Um, with Section 230 in particular, services provided by libraries and educational institutions are, are named in the statutory definition of interactive computer service. So that's one reason that we definitely have a stake um, in being at the table for conversations about reform. But um, we also have a broader interest in preserving the liability protections of Section 230. Um, and that's the, the function, maintaining the functions that I mentioned earlier and the way that we've seen Section 230 since um, the beginning, um, you know, foster uh, intellectual activities, cultural heritage activities, political discourse, information building, knowledge sharing, all the things that libraries and, and the Wikimedia community um, care about. Right, and thank you guys for sharing your positions. It helps us know where you stand. And I think after hearing Senator Wyden speak, um, you know, he's obviously very in your camp and cautioning, you know, against major changes to 230 and um, alluding to sesta fossa and some of, some of the downfalls of that law going to effect. But we still see Congress trying to reform the law. Um, we've heard uh, Senator Lindsey Graham talk about a sunsetting provision if it passes five years later, 230 would go away. Um, that's one of the more extreme viewpoints. And then we have other more narrow carve outs um, wherein it would require transparency reporting of from platforms. That's from Senator Chris Coons and it's bipartisan. Um, Senator Bill Cassidy signed on. That was just reintroduced this year. So we have a, a big spectrum in, in Congress. And um, I'm not necessarily optimistic Congress will <laughs> pass anything on 230 reform. But for, for sake of argument, where do you guys stand on, on any potential reforms? Are there other bills out there you're tracking where you, wherein you see there could be opportunity to um, provide more information to users? I mean, I wonder what you think about transparency requirements could be a basis um, for, for researcher access to some of these large platforms where it is not transparent. They do not have current access. It's not, there's no law requiring such access. Um, what do you guys think of that proposal, for example? Well, I mean, th this is where I think um, the, the fact that a lot of the reforms are focused on big tech. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm often, I often find myself in conversations where people are saying, the platforms. It's like, you know, Wikipedia is a platform. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, right, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so people just aren't thinking about platforms beyond big tech when making proposals. Um, we're not around the table as much. And we have nothing against transparency. Every edit ever made on Wikipedia is, is for, you know, it's, it's public, right? You can go to the history tab on any Wikipedia page. You can see every edit ever made. You can see all the debates about all the edits. You can see, you know, what were the rules for that page and how they were enforced. We publish transparency reports. Um, the machine learning team works with the community to publish what are called model cards on, on the machine learning tools that are used. So, so things are very public and transparent. We have no problem with transparency, right? Um, and, and so that in itself is not a concern. We work with, with, with researchers. We do human rights impact assessments. Um, we do human rights due diligence, right? We, we do a lot of the things that the laws might potentially require. I think part of the problem is, is that when the laws get crafted, they're thinking about particular types of content moderation models. They're thinking about certain types of business models that they're particularly concerned at, about given the harms. And, and then the, the laws, the text of the laws tend to kind of assume that things work in a certain way and, and put in requirements that only work for certain models and don't work as well for other models. So, so that's where kind of being at the table and making sure there aren't unintended consequences that actually make it harder to, to just continue on with our model as it is. Um, we, Wikipedia, itself has been designated in the European Union as a very large online platform under the Digital Services Act. And of course we will comply and we are working on compliance. That includes making some further improvements to our transparency reporting that we're already doing, 
tweaking our terms of use. You know, the 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 um, the you know we do have a terms of use that the foundation sets to to make sure we're compliant with law, even while most of the content rules are set by volunteers, uh, and uh, we have to do our own risk assessment. We have to sub be sub subject to audit. We're all working through that. In principle, this all makes sense. You know, we do believe that we should be, you know, publicly accountable. We've always believed that we're, we're accountable to our community. We're accountable to our stakeholders, and um, you know, we're happy to work with policymakers on incentivizing that accountability for ourselves and others. There are a lot of open questions just in terms of the specifics of the requirements and whether we'll be able to actually implement the requirements with the resources that we have given that we're a nonprofit. So that's kind of an open conversation we have with the regulators. But the Digital Services Act in Europe is a real test for how these kinds of transparency and right. impact assessment requirements may or may not work. Mm -hmm. So it might be worth observing a little bit before kind of jumping into something. Um, and another thing I would point out, and Senator Wyden talked about this too, you know, there there is an order in which it would make sense to do things, mm -hmm. and you know, with all the tools in the toolbox, the privacy law, that is the first step. It's it's not going to solve all the harms, but is the first step towards addressing the most pernicious harms mm -hmm. that are part of the targeted advertising business model, which is not part of the business model of any of, any of those of us represented here. Uh, and, and so why aren't we going for that first, right? Good question. Why aren't we going for some other tools in the toolbox that will not affect public interest platforms in the same way? And, you know, it's like with a recipe. There's a reason why you, you do certain things before you do other things right. if you want the whole thing to make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. And, and this, is, this is the same kind of thing. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we don't quite understand why people are jumping to Section 230 first if their intention is actually to serve the public interest and not some other purpose. Catherine, do you want to wait? When we talked ahead of the panel, you talked about yeah. setting a comprehensive privacy law would be actually address some of the concerns on 230. I critics. think so. And I think just to say that, like the Platform Accountability and Transparency Act, which has been reintroduced um, in particular, you know, the concept of um, allowing researchers access to platform data to inform legislation, to inform, you know, policy changes and proposals, I think is something that, that we could um, get behind. And I say that because I think a lot of the um, Section 230 proposals that we've seen um, aren't necessarily calibrated to, to what they um, purport to, to address or solve. Um, but yes, I think a comprehensive federal privacy um, law that limited or restricted what platforms can do with user data would, would go a long way to, to addressing um, some of these, these challenges um, and, and online harms. And we've, our association has engaged um, with staffers on the um, American Data Privacy and Protection Act um, that was introduced in the last Congress that we'll likely see again in this Congress. Although I don't know if it'll be, need to be updated with considerations for AI, but we'll see. Um, but we think, you know, that law in particular would um, uh, limit or restrict what platforms can do with user data. It would give users more control um, over their data and their information. And we heard the senator talk about, um, you know, civil rights. And so the ADPPA had um, rules against discriminatory practices. And so we think that um, all of that would really go a long way toward addressing some of the, um, some of the online harms that we're concerned about. Right. Peter, Andrew, are, you, are there any bills you're tracking? That... Uh, yeah, I mean, we try to keep up. You know, there's dozens and dozens of them yeah. out there. And I mean, I think that's kind of part of our point, which is, you know, like the Wikimedia Foundation, Internet Archive's a, a 501c3 nonprofit or public charity, right? And um, the, the question with these bills is, with a lot of these bills, is what, what are the sort of the, the like baseline question is, what are the sort of compliance obligations? And, and, and are we interested and, and, and in these areas, is it, does it make sense to impose those? And, and does removing te Section 230 protection make sense as the way to impose those obligations on platforms, right? And, and so I think for us, like we look at a lot of these bills, there's all kinds of good ideas. Like there's lots of good ideas in the bills. A lot of them are, are mostly good ideas about regulating social media companies, which we're not. 
Um, a lot of them are good ideas about fixing sort of what are perceived as competition problems, which would probably be a good idea, but, but we, we're a public charity. We don't really compete at all. We're talking about a business, but we don't have a business model, right? Like we don't sell anything. So, so there's lots of good ideas, but the question is, are they directed towards the right place? And I think, like Rebecca said, people just sort of think, and, and this includes policymakers, oh, the platforms will just fix the platforms. And then they write a bill that, that sort of fundamentally restructures how you can participate online. And it tends to have the effect that Senator Wyden was talking about earlier, which is, well, in the end, it sort of entrenches these big platforms and makes it harder for the next Wikipedia, the next Internet Archive, it makes it harder for, their, for a research library to, to operate and perform its mission, perform its function online. Um, one area we're seeing a lot of concern on the Hill, and probably rightfully so, our focus is discussed earlier, kids' online safety. And um, Senator Durbin, chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee, and the ranking member, Lindsey Graham, have discussed holding a Section 230 hearing in the coming weeks. And it's likely going to be discussing the Earn It Act and the Stop CCM Act. Um, Stop CCM was just introduced this year from Durbin, and it would allow uh, victims of online child sexual abuse um, to have their day in court to sue these platforms. We are talking about large platforms, yes. So um, that's what these these are intended to go after. But I wanted to talk to you guys about what you think those maybe unintended consequences of obviously a noble issue and, and, and a concerning issue. Wall Street Journal reported a lot about that recently, Instagram's algorithm being used to connect pedophile networks. So it's, it's not theoretical, it is happening and it's being taken advantage of on some of these larger platforms. So just this issue of, of CSAM content and do you think that may be an opportunity to open up 230 again, um, to hold them liable for hosting such content. Um, and then secondarily, like where do you think this could hit you guys um, and maybe in an un un unexpected manner? Well, hosting CSAM is illegal. It remains illegal. We take measures to remove it, <laughs> um, to, to keep it off our platforms. We're proactive about it. That's you know, is the case, right? You don't need a new bill for that to be the case. Um, I, I think the Senator pointed to the problems of SESTA-FOSTA uh, and the unintended consequences. And we certainly, along with many other civil society organizations and nonprofits, oppose the Earn It Act mm -hmm. because we believe it's potentially catastrophic both for free speech and for privacy and, and weakening encryption, yeah. um, et cetera. And it's, it's kind of like, you know, yes, there's some ugly stuff on the internet that people should be responsible for dealing with. That's undeniable, but it's kind of like, okay, so there's this cockroach on my kitchen counter, so I'm gonna just blowtorch the whole kitchen and destroy my children's food and everything in the refrigerator and everything else. And, you know, so we really just need to think about, yes, it, we need to get beyond, okay, I have to do something and show that I'm do something and think more holistically about not just how do I address this problem at hand, but what kind of internet environment do I want to create for my communities? for the most vulnerable people who are trying to use the internet, who, who are saying controversial things that powerful people don't like, that might be edgy, mm -hmm. um, that, that might be, you know, some people might find offensive, um, but they have every right to say. Um, and, uh, you know, how do we ensure that, that all perspectives are, are protected in that way and, and not just the, kind of majority viewpoint of, of what is content that's safe for children, mm -hmm. right? Um, there's wide debate about that um, yeah. right now, uh, just in terms of, you know, sort of basic questions about sexuality and so on. Um, so, so we just need to be very careful <laughs> about um, where we take things. Things often sound like a good idea sort of on their face, but as soon as you start digging down into the details, you realize how a bill can get weaponized 
mm -hmm. uh, in, in ways that will really not make anyone safer, um, except for powerful people with lots of money. Mm. Does anyone else want to weigh in on those bills at hand? Or? I think that's really well said, and I'm going to borrow the cockroach analogy, I think, going forward. Um, but I'll just add that this is an area where we, we've um, encouraged, again, members of Congress to, um, to talk to the affected communities and to try to come up with a solution that is more um, you know, calibrated to, to the problem um, that you know, they're, they're trying to address. Libraries are also against child sexual abuse material, and we also want to make sure that um, the internet is a, is a safe place for kids. And, but we also push back on earn it um, because we, we don't think it's the... We don't think it's the solution. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, and to switch back, um, we obviously saw the Supreme Court did not, they punted on ruling on 230. We can, we can get into that, but I think everyone has the same position on being pleased that that's, the law is still intact as, as it was before it went before the court. But we do have two cases in the wings from Net Choice and CCIA that could be taken up this fall. And they're challenging the constitution, constitutionality of two laws in Texas and Florida. Currently, they're not in, in effect right now, but they would um, force platforms, large companies like Twitter, Facebook, um, Instagram, to carry all political viewpoints. and. Um, Wanted to get your views on if these cases were to be taken up by the highest court. Um, we we have a sense that you know they're asking the SG to, to weigh in, and and it, it does seem like these may be cases that Clarence Thomas may want to actually weigh in on. Um, where do you think they an upholding of these laws, allowing them to go into effect? How would those affect your communities? Well, if I, if I could jump in and maybe hand it off to Andrew real quick, and I, I know everybody else has views too, but um, it would be devastating for Wikipedia and the Wikimedia platforms because Wikipedia is about, it's not a free-for-all, it's not a place for people's political views. Um, encyclopedia articles require shared agreements about what constitutes well-sourced content of what constitutes reliable sources. Mm. That means that certain sources, you know, that come from a particular, particularly, you know, farther to either extreme viewpoint um, are not considered reliable by the, by the editor community. And so if the Texas law is upheld, that opens up editors to all kinds of lawsuits just for taking down content that's coming from conspiracy theory websites that the person who posted the content thinks is their political speech. But, you know, Andrew, please, uh, you know, you, you have examples of, of, you know, situations where you all have been editing content that maybe the person who posted it thinks is you know, should should stay. Yeah, I, I just find it's, it's curious that we've tossed out the fairness doctrine for broadcast, mm -hmm. yet yeah. we're looking at this as a new thing on the horizon, right? Where clearly, if you look at airwaves or pathways for broadcasting radio and television are clearly public goods, right? But we don't have fairness doctrine anymore. Mm -hmm. when, when I was growing up, there was. Uh, so this is kind of a, an interesting in quotes, move to try this. Um, but as Rebecca said, in our community, we do have this concept. I mean, if we were to look at one policy that makes Wikipedia work, it's what we call the neutral point of view, right? So that's kind of the, the, kind of the prime directive in Wikipedia. The only way you can get thousands and thousands of editors rowing in the same direction, regardless of whether they're conservative, uh, young, old, liberal, whatever, is to say we have this kind of objectivity kind of ideal to say we want to try to cover everything. Um, in Wikipedia from a way such that all sides can agree and the proportionality of these viewpoints um, are rooted in reliable sourcing and verifiability, right? Um, so if that law that you're talking about has verifiability and reliable sourcing baked into it, maybe, but I don't think it does, right? It's talking about political spectrum and political opinions. So absolutely what Rebecca said is right, is that it would be at odds with the things that not only Wikipedia stand for, but academic research, right? Of any kind of findings of fact of science. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that 
would be really bad. And I'd love to hear librarians. I don't think it's a surprise what librarians would think, but I'd love to hear what you think. Well, it's interesting because I think our concern with the um, federal proposals that we've talked about are that, um, you know, the increased risk of liability will potentially lead to censorship, uh, restriction of free expression, whether that's through, you know, over removing content or throttling it from being uploaded to begin with. These bills in particular are more targeted to, to social media platforms, so might not affect, um, you know, libraries and research libraries directly. But the concern is absolutely the proliferation of misinformation, um, you know, hate speech and harmful content that we're likely to see um, if, you know, these laws um, are to be upheld as constitutional somehow. Um, so, you know, libraries are repeatedly found to be a, a trusted source of reliable information. Um, so I think our concern might be more indirect, but very much about sort of the internet ecosystem um, and the proliferation of, of misinformation um, with, with these laws. How would this affect the way back machine and the internet archive as a whole? Uh, geez, I hope I don't find out. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? I mean, I think, um, you know, starting with Gonzalez, so it, 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 everybody's excited, right? Oh, they're going to change 230, they're going to pull back. And then it turns out they can just decide as a matter of substantive law, well, actually, there's no liability there, which, which I think some people saw sort of a, like, oh, they backed away from 230, they decided they didn't want to do anything after all. But I think it's actually pretty instructive. So 230 is a liability shield. Right, that, that's all it does. If you get rid of 230, what's, what are the underlying causes of action that we wanna put forward, that we wanna hold people and companies and platforms responsible for? Nobody really has a very good answer for that question. Well, many people don't is what I'll say. And so this idea that repealing section 230 is going to like do something structural to the internet, what it's gonna do is it's going to leave to the courts to decide in a bunch of individual cases a bunch of decisions about liability that maybe in the years and years to come will have a structural impact on the internet, but that's gonna take years and there's gonna be this whole process in getting there. And I don't think that's what people actually think they want when they say they wanna repeal section 230. I think they want something else. And, and so the Texas and the Florida laws are an interesting indication of what some people want, I think, when they, when they talk about repealing section 230, when they talk about changing the rules on the internet or about platforms. This is sort of a, something like this, right? And, and when you hear what they say, I mean, it's interesting, and, and to get specifically to your point about the Internet Archive, when, the, when Texas passed the law, the, there were some statements from Texas and then also in the federal courts of appeal saying, oh, well, well this, this law is gonna apply to the three, three dominant platforms. It's gonna apply only to the members of NetChoice, the, the trade group that had sued. And, and that, that's just not what the law says at all, right? That, it, it doesn't say that. It, it says, I think, something like 50 million monthly active users, which is a pretty small universe, but, but it, it doesn't say this is just about Facebook and Twitter, but that's what the policymakers tend to have in mind when they pass laws like this. And so, you know, I think for us, would we meet the threshold of that law? I, I don't know, I, probably not. But, but the point is the laws are written in this way that they're gonna have this broad applicability. And, you know, in this case, are, are almost impossible to comply with, frankly, uh, and aren't going to lead to the result that people want. Yeah, and, and would it lead to you having maybe remove past websites that you're hosting or past versions? I mean, I think, I think again, like whether this law would apply to us or not mm -hmm. is, is, a, is a question for hopefully, I was going to say another day, but hopefully not another day. But um, I think there's, it's absolutely the case that if you pass a broad-based law that just imposes moderation decisions on platforms writ large, you're gonna impose moderation decisions on organizations and websites that have, for example, a preservation function like we do and like many um, libraries and others in the library community do. And I, I don't think that's what you want. I don't think you want to moderate the past away or, or to change what was said in the past, but that's gonna be the outcome of some of these laws if you're not careful about scoping. And unfortunately, even many years on from the beginning of this debate, mm -hmm. People still aren't being as careful as they might be. Right. In that respect. And we're we're seeing um, senators already start to um, attempt to regulate AI and and put forth legislation. Saying last week, but um, Ashley alluded to um, from Senators Hawley and Blumenthal, a, a unique pairing. Um, about um, saying generative con AI content is not covered by Section 230, that you would be held liable. What are your thoughts on that? Even um, Justice um, Gorsuch put the question before th you know, the court. It wasn't answered in, in their rulings, but um, I am curious where all of you stand. We heard where Senator Wyden stands. 
Do you want to, Andrew, have you had to moderate anything from Gen AI yet? Or do you know how to trace it even yet? You can probably imagine Wikipedia has seen a lot of influx yeah. of generative I'm content. Curious. Yeah. Um, I mean, and most of it, I would say, if I were to be daring, most of it's been in, in good faith okay. to say that, you know, hey, you know, if, if I can help write an article in Wikipedia with AI and upload it, or if I can generate an image. Are volunteers it, using it? Yes. Think? Okay. Yeah, then they are. Um, but then we have the big question of like copyright status and mm -hmm. things like that. That's a whole other ball of wax, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I thought uh, Senator Wyden's comment saying that 230 is about hosting quite interesting, right? It was good to hear it from the, the OG 230 guy <laughs> um, on what his views are in, in terms of the, the contemporary issues about AI. Uh, so it's around hosting and not generative AI itself, right? And that's kind of interesting. So I think that's similar to what's going on in Wikipedia right now. It's the debate is not that there's anything against AI or it's about what are we hosting and are we sure that what is being hosted on Wikipedia is clean in terms of the copyright issues and is clean in terms of the legality of you know, with existing laws, yeah. right? And, and, it, have... and it meets the rules that volunteers have set for well-sourced, factual, neutral content, mm -hmm. right. Right? right? Especially, yeah, and, and you know, this is one of the things, AI can mean many things. Mm -hmm. in, in, in fact, there, there are those who argue that the term artificial intelligence is kind of meaningless because it covers so many different yeah, things. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and of course, algorithms too are different things, right? And, and, and so, within Wikimedia and, and Wikimedia platforms, Wikipedia in particular, um, there, there is machine learning that is used to help detect spam, to help detect malicious edits, to help detect bots, mm -hmm. um, but, but it's controlled by humans, right? It's actually used as a tool to empower the human moderators to catch bad stuff and improve and defend the quality of Wikipedia pages at scale in a way they couldn't without these machine learning tools. Right. And that's very different from algorithms uh, or, or AI that is amplifying content, that is targeting people based on data that is collected and profiles that are created about. So, so it's kind of, a technology that is kind of has this overall um, umbrella label that's the same, but it's being used in very different ways. So again, it we have to be careful about reg what we're regulating and not making blanket, overly blunt kind of statements or efforts to regulate. So you could use, so one of the problems with trying to regulate generative AI too broadly is that as Senator Wyden mentions, is it's increasingly just used as a part of search, right? So, of course, there's search on Wikipedia, so you can find things, mm -hmm. right? And, and so, what if you wanted to use some of that functionality that way, or use uh, large language models trained on ourselves to, to help identify disinformation patterns, or you know, false information or something like that, right? So humans can use these tools actually to, to, to really advance the public interest, to advance free knowledge, um, to detect problems as long as you're using it correctly. It all depends on to what end you're using mm -hmm. the technology, not necessarily all instances of the technology in some blanket way. So. Again, we need to be very careful. Um, we do believe in being responsible, accountable, and transparent. <laughs> with, you know, we, are, we have a lot of technical volunteers who work with us on, on the moderation tools. Um, we're very open. Our, our, our engineering teams are very open with the community about what is being deployed and, and the source code. And you know, people debate it and go through it at, at great length. And certainly we have that continued commitment to, to transparency, both kind of with our volunteers as well as the general public on what's happening technically on the projects. Right. Um, and we're doing impact assessment, we're doing risk assessment, um, both to fulfill European legal requirements and because we were doing it anyway, mm. because 
that's the responsible thing to do. Um, so certainly it's not to say that just because we're nonprofit or just because we're Wikipedia, we think we're just intrinsically good on all things and people shouldn't scrutinize what we're doing. We're not saying that at all. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we're also just saying don't uh, legislate in a way that prevents innovation that actually supports um, fact checking mm -hmm. and, and kind of better distribution of high quality, um, well sourced content. Peter and Catherine, are you encountering using generative AI in your fields yet? And you know, where where do you land if it if it were to be regulated, and you would have to be held liable for that? I think so. I think that bill, in particular, is perhaps premature. Um, particularly, yeah. um, you know, we don't want to see this technology throttled through legislation or regulation. Um, but also, you know, without a clear understanding or distinction of what we mean by generative AI, as the senator said, as Rebecca said, um, you know, in the Gonzalez case, ARL joined a brief um, authored by the Electronic Frontier Foundation where we laid out um, all the ways that, you know, search and um, the use of algorithms is um, central to the way that the internet functions. So if you're searching for, um, you know, a journal article or the latest ebook, you know, popular novel or whatever the case may be, um, this, the results are returned in a particular order, in an arrangement based on data and information and that is um, you know if that is swept up in um, a bill that restricts or, or you know allows lawsuits um, opens up liability for the use of generative AI for instance that would be a huge concern for all the reasons that um, that Rebecca has named how about you Peter yeah so I mean so we use uh, some machine learning techniques to mm -hmm. do things like OCR books that we scan and, and a variety of other things like that and that's what AI used to mean until six months ago. <laughs> right. And now it means this this amazing you know uh, future and all these amazing generative tools that have that have come out. So there is that sort of scoping problem again, which is like, what are we talking about here? Like, I, I think we're probably not trying to talk about OCR, but you know, there's a lot of really good, useful tools that we've used to help build our library that are based on the same technologies. So 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 there's that piece of it. And then I think the other thing I would say is. You know, uh, if, if you look at this panel, I mean, we're talking about public interest organizations, right? We're talking about uh, library repositories and libraries and their participation in the internet ecosystem. We're talking about Wikipedia and the role of the Wikimedia Foundation. We're talking about Internet Archive. And I think the question is, do you, do you think the internet is better because Wikipedia is on there, right? Do, do you think the internet is better because there are public interest organizations participating in the internet ecosystem? Or do you think it would be better if it was a closed system that was only run by these very large for-profit companies? I think that's kind of the question that comes up in these platform regulation discussions, uh, at least when you have people like us on the panel. And I, and I think we're going to have that question, or already having that question again with generative AI. There's, there's proposals about, well, you're going to need to have a license, or you're going to need to do a certain thing, or this is going to be limited to a very specific small group of people that that many of them, you know, not only are going to sort of threaten the open source community, but are going to threaten the existence of sort of the Wikimedias of the AI world and the public interest organizations that are otherwise likely to arise and participate in this ecosystem if we let them. I wanted to let everyone know we are opening up to questions from the audience in person or online, so if anyone has any. Um, okay, this gentleman has a question. Hi, I'm Josh Levine. I'm with the American Action Forum, do tech policy over there. I would love to hear your guys' opinion on some of the right to be deleting laws, uh, considering you're all archives and you thrive on the access to information, both present, future, and past. What do you think about some of the proposals out of the EU and then in the states uh, requiring data to be deleted, requiring data to be scraped after a certain point? Uh, how is that going to impact your operations and how do you see those laws moving? The, uh, some of those provisions um, we saw in the version of the ADPPA that was introduced in the last Congress. Um, and so the conversations that we've had with, um, with staffers on 
with congressional staffers on that bill is distinguishing um, data in library collections from patron data. So um, it's it's still a question, but I think we're hoping that um, you know a privacy bill would would include those you know important provisions, um, but in a way that you know libraries as a a covered entity, um, you know, uh, because uh, to your point, right? There's archives, there's yearbooks, there's newspapers, like all of that stuff. So I think we're not sure how it would play, but we have made that point um, to to staffers, and and they're they're very interested in um, in addressing that. Yeah, I mean, white right to be forgotten in in the European Union, in particular, is is being abused with frivolous lawsuits, mm -hmm. and that's a cautionary tale mm -hmm. that uh, people uh, here in the United States need, you know, should be concerned about. Um, yeah, that uh, the the line between what what who is a public figure, what is public interest information versus what is private. There are different views of that, um, and um, yeah, it's it's continuing to be problematic. Any other questions? I have a few. I'll keep going, but um, if anyone has any, feel free to raise your hand. Um, so I wanted to go down the line and um, asking, you know, now Congress is very concerned about AI. We've talked about that, but what are some lessons learned from 230 and then efforts to reform successfully SESTA-FOSTA? Some would say that's not a success, but it did become law. It's the one time it has been changed. Um, what are some lessons learned that you would tell lawmakers as they now approach AI and regulating it um, based on your experience in interacting with lawmakers since 230 was passed and so? in trying to embark on a new technology and, and both, I guess, from different perspectives, not stifle innovation, but also ensure safety and, um, and vulnerable communities are protected at the same time. Senator Wyden named particular um, implications of sesta pasta including, um, you know, uh, bad actors going onto the dark web, violence um, moving from online to the streets, essentially and advocates told Congress that that was going to happen. So I think my lesson or takeaway is to listen to those affected communities. Um, with AI, I mean, that's a broad range of folks, right? But I think like hold hearings, invite witnesses, you know, go on site visits, just listen to um, the folks that are using and affected by um, the technology and, and, you know, with an eye toward not um, stifling or throttling it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, T30, was brought in in the 1990s and allowed for this proliferation of dot coms, user generated content, Web 2.0. It was really kind of the carrier wave of all these things that made um, these things happen, but also gave America an edge in this area. So I know it's hard to to uh, keep focus on that, but it is true that you know Wikipedia could not have survived or not couldn't have risen without this environment that we had in the United States. I think similarly, what's going on with AI, why it's rapidly accelerating and innovating so quickly is because we have 230 thousand people to experiment, post what they've done online and get feedback and iterate, 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 right? So it's all a matter of, as Senator Wyden said, users and iterating and trading information and allowing this innovation to happen. And you couldn't have that if you had um, just the big companies controlling the portals and you couldn't spin up a website, you know, with one minute notice and start posting your content there. And, and having these channels for, for sharing that information. So I think it's definitely very important for the innovations happening, especially in the United States. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess I would just say very quickly, like if, if you look at that, that early stage that we talked about before and that you were just talking about um, of, of innovation on the internet, back when it was sort of exciting, right? Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, uh, if you can remember, it was sort of exciting. And there were all these cool things happening all the time. There were all these new services. Wow, you have a map now. Wow, there's an encyclopedia that people are just writing. It was sort of this very interesting, exciting time where, where, where big things happened. And I think it needed the space to do that. And that's what 230 did. I mean, I think that would be a, a lesson for AI. If you look at, for example, what, the, what they've been doing in the European Union on AI, 
they have spent, they said, oh, AI, next thing, so we need to start doing some regulation. So they worked for a really long time working on the AI Act, and they did good work, and they identified a bunch of specific harms. They were very careful what they were doing. And then six months ago, all these new generative models came out, and they said, oh, wait, no, we've got to change, you know. <laughs> and it just so happened that the bill was still open. If it had happened six months later, they would have had a whole bill passed, and then they would have had to start all over again or something like that, which, I, I mean, I, I think that's sort of part of what you're referring to when you talk about the US system versus some other potential systems of regulation, which is what 230 did in the US, was it allowed this space for innovation and experimentation to sort of happen bottom up. And, and I think we probably need some space for that in, in the new frontiers too. Yeah, I mean, I think one lesson learned is we didn't pass privacy law a long time ago and we are now suffering the consequences and let's let's pass the darn thing now before we suffer a whole set of new consequences that are going to be very, and the Senator alluded to this, very intermingled with state level surveillance and not just by the state of the country you happen to be living in, but nation states you know, from all over the world that are seeking to track people across borders. And uh, you know, we, we definitely protecting people's data, protecting the way it's going to be used and abused, not just by commercial entities, but by state actors, um, is absolutely vital to protecting vulnerable communities. But to, to go back to one other thing that Catherine was saying uh, about everybody who's warning about SESTA-FOSTA, and then lo and behold, they were right. <laughs> um, a lot of a, a lot of civil society, um, civil liberties groups, human rights groups have been calling on government, both here in the United States and elsewhere, for quite some time, that before you pass a law that's affecting how the internet works, do a human rights impact assessment, do a civil liberties impact assessment, really red team it through. How is this thing? You know, what's going to go wrong here? Um, just, you know, just like you do environmental impact assessments and things like that, you know, that, that, that it actually needs to be thought through the most vulnerable communities, you know, faced by the most bad faith actors out there. How are those two things going to play out mm -hmm. when such and such law gets passed? And if that had been done with SESTA-FOSTA, I think it would have, you know, people were already warning that that, that was going to happen. Um, and that ne needs to be take, taken seriously. And, and relatedly, you know, there's this mentality, I think, that you can fix the internet, like you fix your television or you fix your refrigerator, mm -hmm. like you fix an appliance. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like saying, I'm gonna fix crime in Washington, DC, mm -hmm. right? Sure, you could fix crime in Washington, D.C. and have zero crime. We'd be Pyongyang, just like the capital of North Korea, right? There's a reason why we don't want to be the capital of North Korea, right? It's, it's about governance. It's about making sure that, yes, you have rules because you don't want to be a state of nature. You want to be able to walk outside in broad daylight as a woman, right? Which you can't do without police and without rules. But... But the rules and the enforcement need to need to interact well with the community and need to make sure that people's civil, civil liberties and economic rights and other things are all taken into account, right? And, and you don't just kind of say, okay, I'm going to pass this thing, stop and frisk, and that's going to like solve crime in Washington, D.C., you know, problem fixed. And, but people seem to have that kind of let's fix the internet mentality when it comes to legislation mm -hmm. that just doesn't make any sense. Yeah, right. And we do have an audience qu question from online. And um, this person's asking, isn't another reason to think carefully about Section 230 reforms is because of its profoundly global impact, which you've all, you're alluding to. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, these are global companies and a lot of how they act here is how they try to act abroad, but we've seen some censorship in India and other countries. So, you know, to what extent do you think 230 has been able to be globalized? And also where do you think it butts up against regional restrictions? Yeah, I mean, just to give an example also how Internet Archive and Wikipedia and other things. So 
as, as we discussed, Section two, uh, Wikipedia would not exist without Section 230. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia is accessible in hundreds of languages around the world. So just one really specific example is in Hong Kong, where a bunch of newspapers have been shut down and their websites have been taken off the internet. Dun, da, da, enter Internet Archive. So the Apple Daily, whose publisher is now in jail in Hong Kong, um, went offline, but the Internet Archive has archived their articles. And so there are a bunch of articles on Wikipedia that are based on sources whose websites no longer exist because they got shut down by the government, right. but you can still access that content and it is still linked on Wikipedia pages thanks to the Internet Archive. Mm -hmm. And so thanks to, you know, and Wikipedia is, is able to exist with that information thanks to Section 230. Right, and and the people editing these these pages are all over the world, of course, including in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and you know, somebody in the United States might sue an editor editing something about Hong Kong because they think their political speech got you know it, it could be weaponized mm -hmm. in ways that nobody's thinking of right now, based on political views of people in relation to the politics in other countries, mm -hmm. right? Um, so a, again, it, it has a big impact globally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. I think my last question would be for each of you, like what is your one ask from Congress right now um, with 230 reform? And as they're, you know, imagining legislating on AI, we'll see. Um, what would you advise them if, if they were to ask for your, your community's input? I think invite us to be witnesses at the upcoming hearing would be great, yeah. truly. Yeah. Like I keep saying, hearing from affected yeah. communities and that's one way of doing it, right? Um, we've also signed, um, you know, big tent letters, right? Um, sort of laying out a lot of these points and they've, you know, been entered into the record. So I think just like the more advocacy, you know, we can do the better. Um, and I, I also wanted to, yeah, I mean, I think that's such a great question about sort of the, you know, globalness of these issues and privacy and everything that we've um, talked about. Because I do think there are other, so ARL has talked to other um, national library associations and other countries around what what is the vision for, you know, a, a safe and inclusive um, internet. and. Are there, you know, things that we can come together on? And one thing is, um, the UN has said that internet access is a, you know, is a human right, and libraries provide, you know, internet access. So, what is our obligation there? Um, and, uh, you know, revisiting net neutrality principles and rules or other potential solutions. So, I think um, it's, you know, listening to affected communities and sort of uh, broadening the scope of, um, or understanding the problem that's to be solved um, and again working toward those solutions and it's not just one problem right there's you know child sexual abuse material there's um, all kinds of issues on online but I think to to again work on um, calibrating you know solutions um, to the problems listening to affected communities inviting us to the table um, would, would all be really beneficial I think well, to everybody mm -hmm. yeah I'll take some of my time just to amplify what she said is like the nice thing about I lived outside the US for six years teaching overseas, and you realize, looking around other folks, a lot of governments have a lot of respect for scholarship, academics, libraries, museums. Unfortunately, in the United States, it is not the same. And it's kind of surprising in that they don't bring in a lot of folks who are experts or scholars, mm -hmm. or memory institutions, um, social science research, uh, as, as Rebecca said. Um, it's amazing how much Congress does not embrace that level of expertise for a lot of its um, uh, deliberation. So I think that is something that I definitely agree with you on, is that bring us to the table, um, just emphasize how much Wikipedia would not exist without Internet Archive and libraries, right? We talked about how Wikipedia relies on verifiable information. That chain of verification is rooted in what libraries provide as the base material and preserving it for long term and in our archive in terms of when sites go away, link rot as we call it, or when sites get shut down. Something as you know, far away as Apple Daily, but also things like the newspapers in Colorado, right? The, the, the uh, Rocky Mountain News and all those folks, Pulitzer Prize winning organizations, they're just gone. And only in our archive, and these folks have a copy of that. We would have to delete hundreds and thousands of articles in Wikipedia a day if we didn't have these two folks 
um, or these two types of organizations working with us. So for Congress to appreciate that we are an ecosystem that is so crucial to not only global knowledge, but American competitiveness. If you just want to pander to make America really competitive in this area, keep 230 around so that we're still in that leadership position. Yeah, I mean, I'll just keep piling on, I guess. I mean, I think, you know, the market's amazing and, and, and the ability of markets to like solve real problems and build real things is, is, is like incredible, right? It's amazing. But there are things where there's just no market incentive um, for them to create or exist or to, to continue to exist. And, and we keep talking about preservation and obviously there's a reason why I keep talking about that. But um, that's an important area. So we preserve a lot of books, millions and millions of books that we've preserved that there's just no market incentive to preserve them once they're no longer commercially viable. There just isn't one. And if we can digitize them and preserve them for the long haul, that's an important public good. That helps a lot. Many of them are cited in Wikipedia articles. Many of them are really important to researchers um, across all different spectrums. And, and there's just not a good market mechanism for solving that problem. And so I think it's important, what I would say is, is just echoing what the two of you have said, which is, you, you, we should keep that in mind, right? When we create new rules of the road, whether it's AI or anything else, that we, that we wanna have a space for public interest organizations like these ones to fulfill their mission-driven um, roles, which are often and most often the roles that the market's not designed well to solve. Yeah, just finally the ask to Congress is mm -hmm. every time you draft something, bring us all in and ask the question, what will this mean for Wikipedia? What will this mean for the Internet Archive, how will it how will it affect libraries? Mm -hmm. Game it through with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Well, thank you guys. This is a really interesting panel and thanks for all the online and audience questions. Um, I want to cue it to the other Rebecca um, <laughs> for closing statements as the co-host of the event. But thank you guys for the opportunity. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm just going to say just real quick because I, I said most things already um but thanks so much to new america for for hosting this event today um i used to work here so it, it feels like a real homecoming uh as well so so very grateful for that and and just to 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 re-emphasize that in this age of chat gpt and generative ai facts and the people who both report, curate, preserve, share, archive facts are more, more vulnerable than ever to attack by those who would rather perpetuate other narratives mm -hmm. uh, and more valuable than ever because both economically but, but also as, as far as an open and, and democratic society is concerned Without Wikipedians, without independent journalism, independent researchers, archives, libraries, public interest technology, open data repositories, without this ecosystem, call it the digital commons, call it digital public infrastructure, call it what you will, public interest technology, without this, we're nothing but you know, a big swamp of, of, of kind of hallucinating large language models, or that's what we can become, or something that's manipulated by those with the most power and money. So we need to make sure that the law is preserving and protecting not just the models, but the people who do this work, who are the most vulnerable to attack now than ever. And, you know, not just in this country, but in some other countries, seriously vulnerable. And it's, it's you know, of the things that, that keep me up at night, um, how do we protect Wikipedians all over the world who are trying to get information out about Ukraine, you know, websites in Russia or wherever it is that are going offline that are being preserved by Internet Archive, research that has no home anywhere except in libraries that, you know, 
uh, are, are funded and, and protected against the political vagaries of many other regimes. Mm -hmm. it's, it's so important for the future of the world, and, and I really hope that our, our political leaders and lawmakers will do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Yeah.